I will be the first to admit that my dog is a princess. I say it all the time because she is. I will take her for walks and hikes and we'll do all the things that are like within a couple of hours. <laughs> but there are, there's like this growing population, I, I think possibly because of the past few years where people are wanting to be more off grid. People are homesteading. People are doing all the things to get away and break free from technology, which I am here for as long as you still listen to your podcast. <laughs> and um, so I, today, because that is not me, I would love to do that, but I am not in a season of life to do that at the moment, and neither is my dog. So I have a very special guest for you today. Her name is Kara Hanrahan, and she is with Raw Paw Adventures. And that is exactly what it sounds like because she has raw fed dogs and they go on adventures all the time. So they travel and they do lots of like off grid travel, which is terrifying and exciting. And I'm going to let her explain all of that to you because, oh my goodness, how do we do that with raw fed dogs? So Kara, thank you so much for being here. Would you mind um, telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited, actually, and it's so funny. You say it's terrifying, but it's not. It's actually just a lot of fun. Um, so a little bit about myself. I, <laughs> This is what I tell people when they first meet me. I have three dogs, three cats, three Jeeps, and a husband. Uh, yeah. And we... <laughs> And uh, all of that together, except for the cats, um, we'll go, we like to just go on adventures and, um, you know, we'll go off-roading in the Jeeps, we'll go hiking, we'll go camping. Sometimes we're totally off-grid, like dispersed camping, no facilities, no bathrooms, no refrigerators. Um, and then other times we're in, <laughs> other times we're in a little bit more populated of an area um, where we have access to like grocery stores and stuff like that. So. So it's a lot of fun. Um, it's part of the reason why we moved to California from Buffalo, because New York uh, only has a good four months, maybe, of, of outside season compared to California, which is probably a good eight to ten. So, yeah, that's what we're doing. So the first thing I thought is no bathroom. <laughs> you and your husband must really like each other. <laughs> <laughs> that's what deodorant's for. Wet wipes, you know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I... I need it. Not only do I need, like, we need multiple bathrooms. <laughs> like, you go in the other one. I'll use this one. We're good. Like, just keep things separate. <laughs> we make up for it when we come back because there's three bathrooms in our cabin. So. Okay, so you recently went on one of these adventures. Um, tell me about that because it didn't quite go as planned. So maybe tell me like what you thought was going to happen and then what actually happened. <laughs> For sure. And I just want to say I do have a cold, <clears throat> so I might sound oh. a little measly and I'm sipping my tea. So <laughs> tea with honey, local honey, actually. So. Mm. so yeah, my adventure, boy, I was not, it was an experience. And I, I, I think that it was good that so many things went awry because as much as I like to say that I, I almost feel like an expert at traveling with my dogs, um, this like clearly shows that you have to be prepared for anything. And I think it's a really good thing to talk about. So this past weekend, we went to, um, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm located in San Jose, California, which is like mid to north. And we went about five hours east and a little bit south. Uh, to Bodie, California, and there's just all kinds of beautiful landscapes, national parks. Um, we went to a park called Ancient Bristlecone Pine, which is as cool as it sounds. Yeah. And a lot of things went wrong. So uh, for one, I when I travel with the dog, so I have four big, I would almost call them categories um, that I think about. So Safety is a big one. Um, their comfort is very important. Uh, first aid for potential injuries or whatever. And then like food and actual living needs. And so we definitely had some food issues. So depending on how long I'm camping and depending on where we're going, I will either bring their prepped raw containers uh, for a day or maybe two. Or I will bring only a more shelf-stable, air-dried, dehydrated, or freeze-dried food. 
So we were in bear country and it was rather remote. I did not have access to a refrigerator um, and we only had our Yeti, uh, which is rated as bear proof, but you know, I don't know about that. So, <laughs> um, so I did not bring any of their raw prepped containers. Instead, I brought some freeze dried and I had two, uh, I had a freeze dried and a dehydrated. So the freeze dried was actually the New Zealand uh, natural pet food company. I don't know if you've ever heard of them before. Yeah, I feed actually, I feed their air dried to my cats. Um, and I had some freeze dried that I got from them at Super Zoo. And so I brought that with me and it was a brand new bag. And that was enough for perhaps a day and a half for three big dogs because it's not that big of a, a bag. The second bag I brought was Sundays for dogs. And this is a, um, I, I think it was also an air dried food. I can't remember if it's air dried or dehydrated, but I, I had it left over unopened, but left over from a trip I went on several months ago. And I did not look at the expiration date. And first day there, I open it up and I go to, and I look in the bag and it just molds everywhere. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so now I'm on a four day trip with a day and a half worth of food. Uh, and so, so luckily the dogs are very forgiving. Um, so I try to always bring something for them for enrichment. Um, for settling down at the end of the night. Sometimes they're exhausted from whatever we did, hiking, or even honestly being in the back of the Jeep when I'm off-roading is tiring for them because they're keeping their balance and they're trying to you know, stay comfortable. And so sometimes they're exhausted and they fall down onto their dog beds and they sleep until the sun comes up. But sometimes they're not. And the people that you're with don't always appreciate a crazy dog around a campfire at the end of the night. So I try and bring treats or chews um, in this case, I had a bunch of real dog box products. And so on day one and two, I fed them the freeze dried. I stretched it out a little bit. They got a little bit less calories than they normally would, which is fine. And then on day three, they had only real dog box. So I gave them uh, some, I think I had duck necks. Uh, and then I had some heads as well. And then I had some super chews that I brought with me. Um, and that was enough. And then I also shared a little bit of our ground beef that we had brought to make hamburgers and tacos. I just opened one of the packages, split it between the three dogs. And I was like, here you go. <laughs> so, so I think it just kind of shows for one, be prepared and maybe check your expiration dates. If you're going <laughs> to use a shelf, <laughs> a shelf stable food, excuse me. <clears throat> um, but if you're not be ready to just kind of think on your feet and figure out what to do. And if that means going up to a grocery store, if there's one near you and buying a couple pounds of ground beef and just giving it to them, fine. And if it means improvising or maybe they're going to have a fasting day, but that's kind of what we did is we improvised and it went fine. Yeah, I think so. That that was my first thought was like, okay, well, we'll just fast, right? Because no big deal. Mm -hmm. Like we can do that with our dogs and it's yeah. good for them. In fact, you know, I've been starting, well, I've been researching fasting for myself and kind of starting to research it for dogs too. Not that I'm like, it's not a new concept to me, but um, just the idea of fasting for uh, like when a dog has some sort of illness or disease that, it, you know, it could be beneficial to let the body kind of a, a, expend all of its energy attacking whatever it needs to attack and creating, yeah. you know, um, the space for autophagy to kind of naturally happen in the body. Like, that's a great thing. But then, but then my mind goes to, okay, but they are like actually, <clears throat> using a whole lot more, like they, they could potentially use additional calories on these days when they're out hiking. And like you said, even being in the back of the Jeep is, can be exhausting um, on the body because you're just constantly like moving and trying to get, keep your balance and all of the things. So like maybe fasting wouldn't be, it wouldn't be like the optimal time for fasting, but it could still work. <laughs> So even giving them like fewer calories didn't make them feel tired or anything. And that's, I, I, I'm assuming they just they had roll too much with energy, it, right? girl. 
but no, but you're absolutely right. And I agree. So that's a reason why on a trip like this, I would not have fasted them because we were like, we, when we went up to the forest, the national forest, um, we were at like 11,000 feet elevation and it took a couple of hours to get up there in the Jeep. And then we got out and we walked around, we explored, we did a little um, mile hike and at that elevation, it's, I mean, you're already tired. You take like 10 steps and you're like, whew, I should be going to the gym. But, you know, so yes, on something like that, I probably would not fast them. If we were just doing a super chill, you know, backyard camping, not doing anything strenuous, just like relaxing in nature, get away from suburbia, then perhaps. But, and also, wow. Um, I have a, I think a really good article from the New England Journal of Medicine about intermittent fasting, which is about humans, but can be applied to dogs. If you want, I'll send it to you after this. Yeah. No, I've been doing a lot of research into it, especially, um, so I've been listening to Dr. Mindy Peltz a lot because she is specifically researching or has been researching fasting for women because we have to do it differently because of our hormonal cycles. Um, so, and that's, that's, what's making me wonder more about dogs. Like it probably isn't as straightforward because of females having different hormonal cycles, even female dogs having different, but then spayed and neutered dogs, like how, so that's where I'm like, let me, let me see if I can figure, figure this out and make sure <laughs> I've got it right. Um, because they're not, I mean, we, to get off totally off topic we know that like when we spay and neuter spay or neuter an animal that the hormone cycle is completely out of balance um and where you know these organs that would normally produce hormones um grh i think it is to tell other parts of the body to to start or stop producing other hormones like luteinizing hormone so mm -hmm the luteinizing hormone hormone just goes crazy out of whack and is constantly producing because, and, and it, it really messes with the body. Um, and that's why, where we get this new thing that we're just being introduced to called spay and neuter syndrome, because it is actually quite devastating, um, long-term mm -hmm. on the body. So I'm very interested in learning more about fasting. <laughs> actually, I really didn't even think of that because I've always, all of my dogs are spayed and neutered, but they're, um, I mean, the rescue dogs, you can't even take them home without them being right. You know, fixed. And it's, it's yes. so frustrating, but, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. The pituitary is my least favorite organ in the body. <laughs> <laughs> it has, it has in charge of way too many hormones. I can't remember all of them even after 10 years of working in medicine. <laughs> Give me the list. So I, yes. I hear you. And when you take away the gonads, you know, the ovaries are gone, the testicles are gone. It's like everything goes haywire. And so, so that's actually, right. I have to start looking into her because I haven't listened to or read anything um, by that person. Yes. So. It's so interesting. I was talking to some people at AHVMA about it because um, when fasting, <clears throat> like, I don't know, a decade or so ago became like super popular, like, you know, all, all the popular people were doing it. Um, men and women both were fast, inter, just, just intermittent fasting, not even any of the other types of extended fasting, but just intermittent fasting. Um, women were like, after a few months, were starting to not get their period and to lose their hair. And, and it's all because of the fact that we produce hormones differently. So like a man, and we're getting totally off topic, but I love it. So <laughs> a man is going to produce testosterone every 15 minutes, but a woman goes through like once your cycle starts, you're producing estrogen for, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10 days. And then you're going to produce, pro um, I'm sorry, uh, testosterone for mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine, 10 days. And then you're going to produce progesterone leading into menstruation again. So that progesterone cycle or that luteal cycle, you should not be fasting. Um, so the other 20 some days of the month, you're good. But when your, your body is preparing to menstruate in that like final week, you should, should not be fasting. Um, 
So yeah, it's, it's so interesting <laughs> to me. Yeah, actually, a lot of people don't know that women um, produce testosterone. And so I actually had a patient last week who was on um, dual estrogen testosterone replacement therapy. And the intern that I was with thought that his first assumption was that the patient was maybe going through like tra transgender, um, like gender reassignment because the testosterone. Mm. And I was like, I was like, well, let's go ask her. But no. And so we went, we talked to her and she's like, no, it's just hormone replacement therapy. He had no idea. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I guess we do think of, but it, I mean, they produce so much more of it than we do, but I mean, we still produce a good amount of it, but yeah. Yeah. And just so everybody knows, Kara is a, um, ER nurse, correct? <laughs> so, you were very close. So I okay. actually work in the ICU now, but it's okay. all critical care. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner. Okay. So I was, I was a nurse. I'm still a nurse technically. And then I con continued school with my master's and now I'm an NP. Awesome. Yeah. My, um, so my stepson is, oh boy, I don't know what he is. He's, he is a nurse, but he has a ton of extra stuff that he's done. And he works at, um, the Cleveland clinic in the heart lung transplant center. Wow. And so he's done so many things like continuing. I don't know. He was going to do CRNA school, but now he's like, burnout I think <laughs> yeah girl I hear that I hear that although I feel you know it kind of comes in waves I had that burnout for I had some burnout for a while in 2020 and 2021 and I was just exhausted and working like 300 hours a month sometimes and because you just you couldn't say no you know, with everything yeah. that was going on and then switched from ER to ICU and moved across the country. And I, I feel a little bit rejuvenated now, but um, more than that, I really started digging deep into my dogs and canine nutrition. And after kind of years of just fiddling with it and looking here and there and, you know, trying this or that, I finally decided to actually really dedicate my time to canine nutrition. And that more than anything I think gave me a new, like a new lease on medicine, like a new, something fresh, something to think about on top of kind of the same old thing. Although you can't really say that about critical care. It's never the same old thing, but, um, but you know, it just gave me, it opened my eyes and made me realize like, there's always more. And I, I'm, I'm glad because I was starting to get worried that I had quite a long career still ahead of me in medicine and I was going to not enjoy any of it by the end, but yeah. Right. Cause you're very young. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about like how, how you feed your animals. But bef before we get into that, um, I, I am so interested in this like dichotomy of, you know, holistic care and setting up the body to be able to do what it does best, which is heal itself versus, our our current medical system, which is very um, reactive. So because you work in critical care, I mean, that is, I think, the perfect place for the training that you probably got, because it is all acute injury type stuff. I mean, generally, mm -hmm. like you're dealing with, oh, crap, this is really, really bad. And we've just got to get in here and like, make it work long enough yeah i know you're That's right cool. you're right you're right um so like how did you go from because the reality of going through any sort of medical training western medical training is very like is very indoctrinating right and so to get from you know me, like traditional western i said you say western medical training to like feeding your dogs a raw food diet. I think that takes, uh, we're very special people <laughs> that we can, <laughs> we can do that and we yeah. can like break away from everything we've been told and everything we've been taught for the first, I don't know, 20 some odd years of our lives generally, because we are so indoctrinated in school and with doctors and with like, so how, how did that go for you? Like how did, what, what, what made you do that? What made you break away? Um, my dogs all had problems. 
And I, I looked at my three young dogs and said, well, I'm doing everything right. <laughs> Why are they all sick? Right. So my oldest dog, um, his name is Copper. He's seven and he's a rescue. First dog I ever had, no childhood dog. And so I got him at seven. I, or sorry, I got him when he was a puppy. Um, and I had just become a nurse practitioner. And so I, you know, fed him Purina Pro Plan, large breed, because he was estimated to be a large breed. Um, you know, I got him neutered. Well, I had to because, you know, I got him from a rescue. So he was only, I think, three months old, maybe four months old. And, um, you know, I got him his vaccines and, and within a few months of having him, he would, he would have, he, he never ate. He never, I would put the food in front of him and I would have to be like, Copper, eat your food. Copper, eat your food. I mean, we would be sitting there for a half an hour, 45 minutes, trying to get him to eat anything out of my hand sometimes. And he would have these episodes of just vomiting multiple times in a day. His poop was just like, soft serve, I mean, was not great. It's uh, more like you're picking up a, a schmear from the grass, you know, than anything else. And, you know, I brought it up to the vet and they were like, oh, you know, a lot of dogs have sensitive stomachs. I'm like, okay. And so it wasn't until he was two and between his yearlies, he had lost weight. So at this point he was about 50 pounds and he was like maybe 54 or 55 or something on year one. And they were like, oh, you know, yeah, I don't know. That's not normal. You shouldn't be losing weight like that. So I insisted. They finally did blood work. And I wish I had his records because I would love to actually look at the blood work and see exactly what it is they read off. But unfortunately, I did not apply any of my medical knowledge of humans toward my dog. And so they told me that he had chronic pancreatitis. And I was like, well, how did my dog get pancreatitis? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And they were like, oh, he probably got into the grease trap on the grill. And I was like, no. She's like, well, you shouldn't be giving him table scraps. I'm like, I don't. I literally have never fed him anything other than the food, the dry kibble pro plan that, you know, I was told to give him when I adopted him. And so their solution was to put him on a prescription low fat diet. Uh, And uh, nothing changed. And he kept having, you know, episodes every month or so. It's so heartbreaking to see your dog in pain. And still would not eat anything. So that was him. And then my golden retriever, he had terrible allergies. He would have diarrhea all the time. Um, Again, he got like multiple rounds of flagell. Um, You know, um, God, what's that? It's it's like not really a probiotic. Fortiflora? Yeah. 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 He got that on his Purina Pro plan. You know, finally, I was like, my friend even was said to me, well, maybe he's allergic to chicken. So I was like, oh, God. Yeah, that makes sense. So I switched him to a different protein Purina Pro plan. You know, it still has chicken meal in it. I did like the lamb formula or something. Still has chicken. I don't know what I was doing. (laughs) Uh, Constant yeast overgrowth, ear infections, hot spots, like the works. And then my smallest dog, Piper, she was my husband's dog before I met him. Well, she's still, you know, she's ours now. Um, She would need to have like her anal glands expressed all the time. She also had GI issues. One time she got a contaminated batch of kibble and lost a ton of weight. And she's like a little thing. She only weighs 35 pounds. um, And she was like dangerously thin. So I finally, I looked around and I was like, this is not normal. You know, we're doing all the things. They get seen yearly. They're, they're, and the first, Uh, actually the first bit of information that I stumbled across, and this is because I'm a Grey's Anatomy fan, was Catherine Heigl's Badlands Ranch. I just saw a commercial come up on my Facebook. This was probably like five years ago. Uh, And I was like, oh, Izzy Stevens. (laughs) And so I opened it and I started reading and I was like, this woman's crazy. What's she doing feeding t- human food to dogs? And uh, it actually wasn't until about a year after that that I was like, Let's go back and check this out because maybe she's not crazy. And that really kind of started my journey. And so now that they've been off of kibble for a couple of years, um, my, Copper has not had one single pancreatitis flare. And his food is 45% fat. Yeah, it's pretty the pres- yeah. the pretty high, right? The prescription diet yeah. was five percent, nine percent. Excuse me, nine percent. How am I giving my pancreatitis dog forty five percent fat? 
It was because he got pancreatitis from the carb load in the kibble. Yeah, I think that's one of like the biggest. There are two, like, well, yeah, two that I'm thinking of right now, like off the top of my head, like huge things that we're not talking about that we should be talking about is that like people don't understand what actually causes pancreatitis <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. not healthy fats. That's for sure. Like I don't, they just want to demonize fats like they did with us. Right. Yep. For, yep. And they still try to like demonize all the healthy don't eat the stuff that we so only eat the right? egg like yes like we <laughs> should be eating every single day we should be having eggs yeah. and red meat and like we should be eating these things but they don't want us to yeah. um it is the same thing for dogs healthy fats but you you know when you're feeding kibble you know you're feeding rancid mm -hmm. oxidized fats plus yeah. a huge carbohydrate load that the dog, the only way they can digest it is with the pancreas working overtime to produce amylase. Yep. And it's, it's just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So you've got all these like rancid fats that are oxidized mm. and ugh, I just want to, I know it's so gross. Anyway, <laughs> I know. Oh, I know. I, and I think, I think that, you know, for him in particular, he probably is maybe somewhat deficient in amylase or maybe doesn't have a ton of like copies of the amylase gene. He maybe just does not make as much as another dog does. Um, and he just was unlucky in that sense. And that's, you know, what happened, but now he gets, you know, a little bit of steamed veggies, uh, or puree veggies for fiber. Um, and, and he's, and he gained 15 pounds. He looks amazing. He's, he's one third great Pyrenees. That is not a dog that should weigh 50 pounds. No. Like, so now he's a healthy 65 pounds. He looks amazing. Perfect body condition score, in my opinion. And he, I'm going to actually post today a super cute video of me feeding him. He does this cute little leap. Like he's a fawn leaping into the air when I release him with okay to come and get his food. It is the cutest thing. And it makes me smile so broadly every time because this is a dog who I would have to hand feed for 45 minutes to get him to eat a cup of kibble. And now he literally jumps for joy before eating his food. And I am just ecstatic about it. So, yeah. But, That's but to answer, I don't think I actually answered your question, which was like, how do you get past almost the indoctrination? And the answer is, it, it takes, it took a hot minute. It really did take a few years for me. And now I like to apply that knowledge to my patients um, whenever I can, because you're right. And I'm going to give you a quick example. So there's something called the surviving sepsis uh, guidelines. And sepsis is just like a body-wide infection, can be in the bloodstream. Um, it's life-threatening. Uh, a lot of people die from sepsis every year. And yeah. so as a part of the guidelines, if somebody comes in and they meet, let's say I'm working in the emergency room, and they meet sepsis criteria, which is like based on their vital signs and if you suspect an infection, um, you have to administer antibiotics to them within three hours or else you get like a mark or a flag against your institution. Mm -hmm. And I have had, I'm just gonna adjust my AirPods. I have had patients, uh, I, I recall very strongly um, a patient, this was maybe four or five years ago, so not at my current job, who came in and they were septic and they had recently been there a few months prior and they had a multi-drug resistant organism in their urine. And I wanted to give them the antibiotic that based on their previously previous records and cultures I knew would be effective but that antibiotic was not on the list of surviving surviving sepsis approved antibiotics and when I brought this up to my attending physician who we work very closely with his answer unfortunately was well it doesn't matter <laughs> what the chart says it matters what the uh the guidelines say so I had to give this patient an antibiotic that I knew their their bacteria was resistant to because a guideline said I had to. And that is deplorable. And I understand why we have guidelines, right? Because you need something. You have to standardize care. But then you need to also be able to take a step beyond that and look at the individual patient. And I think that's a problem in both Western medicine and veterinary medicine is you you forget to look at the individual and take the time and say, okay, 
this might be what works for everybody else, but this might not be what works for you. And a lot of the problem with that is overcrowding. There's not enough medical staff, both human and veterinary. You know, you might have, if you go into your primary care office, you know, insurance only a lot, some 15 minutes with you. <laughs> like it's, it's insane. And so I don't know, things got to change, girl. I don't know. It is. It's crazy. And one of the things that um, oh, I don't remember if it was AHVMA or at the Feed Real Summit because uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Katie Kangas was at both. But she, it was and it was like in a discussion. It wasn't I don't think on a panel. I think it was just in a like a a group discussion. And we were talking about antibiotics and how. So two interesting facts. So that I, one I got from Jonathan Lau. So he was on the podcast. Um, if you haven't listened to it as a listener, I'm talking to my listeners. <laughs> if you haven't listened <laughs> to the podcast with Jonathan Lau, he's with O3 Vets. So he does um, ozone therapy. So one yeah. thing I, I learned is that the biofilm in the gut is very, very difficult to break through. And antibiotics have a very difficult time. A lot of them can't do it. Um, but what's interesting, and, and I think one of the reasons why so many people are not seeing the results they're looking for with uh, fecal transplants or FMT, cap specifically using the FMT capsules, because it's really difficult to find a vet that's actually doing fecal transplants in office. That's incredibly <laughs> difficult to find. But if we can do, yeah. if we can do ozone therapy first, that will break down the biofilm in the gut, then do the, the FMT capsules, like the rate of acceptance of the, the bacteria from the FMT capsules increases like something crazy, like 70, 80%. Wow. So one thing, that's something to think about with antibiotics too is like if it can't break through the biofilm which is where a lot of this bacteria most of the bacteria lives inside of the biofilm then we're just taking these antibiotics for no reason right like they're not doing anything um yeah but one of the other things we were talking about and this is what katie kangas was talking about was the natural remedies that we can use in place of antibiotics. So like bacteriophages or even like oil of oregano, which is a natural antibiotic can and does work really well on a lot of these um, antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria, but we're not using them. Why aren't we using them? Like, you know, like Because it's not part of the standard of care and our yeah. Western medical system, which drives me up the wall, but it is what it is. So people yeah. like us have to like do our research and like heal ourselves and heal our dogs because Western medicine isn't doing it. It's funny you mentioned oil of oregano, oregano because not to be confused with oregano essential oil, which are right. different. Um, and I didn't know that, you know, when I first started looking into like holistic things for my dogs, but um, Bear, right when I, so he's my golden retriever. He's about four. He'll be five in December. Um, when I first switched him to raw, I, and he's the one who used to have yeast. Um, I knew that I was probably going to see some yeast still. And so I actually did the yeasty beast and the, um, the, uh, uh, leaky gut protocol, excuse me, from adored beast, um, on him right after I switched him to raw. And he did get, I think just from like a detoxing period, he got a, a nasty yeast in his ear. And so I was like, all right, I'm not trying to give him anything for this other than natural unless I absolutely have to. So I started digging into different methods that I could use for that. And oil of oregano was one of the things that came up. Um, and I didn't realize at first that it was different than oregano essential oil. Um, and so I ended up being like, because I went into um, my, I have the animal desk uh, reference, uh, which is like this ginormous book about all the essential oils yeah. and I looked at that one and it's not dog safe. So I was like, yeah, I pointed behind me. Like you can see behind my back, but um, I know I'm like, mine's so over here like, too, but you can't see it. So I, like, oh, no, can't use it. so I ended up getting Zymox um, to hopefully like, you know, prevent the yeast from having something to feed off of. And I used like a diluted apple cider vinegar and some coconut oil, et cetera. And it did eventually clear up. It took a while, um, but it did clear up. But 
Yeah, I think there are so many modalities out there and people either don't know about them or they don't have access to them. You don't even know what questions to ask unless I think you have already kind of started. And the amount of information that is out there to consider, you know, holistic care is overwhelming. I mean, it will like crush you like you're standing at the bottom of the ocean and you really need to be able to kind of wade through rather than jump right in because otherwise you'll be overwhelmed and you will just drown in that information and and then you're then you absorb nothing. So, it's like kind of figuring out which path to go down first and then, you know, then you're like, "All right, let me take a step back now." And now I'm going to look over here. It's just because I made that mistake when I first started and I was like, I feel like my head's going to explode. I can't do this. So. It is. And there's a lot of bad information too. Um, there's a lot of bad information. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Which, and it's, and none of it is, you know, when it's coming from the fresh feeding community, none of it is nefarious. People don't do it on no. purpose. Mm-mm. But you read, you know, someone will go on a page and ask for advice and you see, you know, a recommendation from someone and you read it and you're like, no. Right. I know. I can't. I, I've been out of like, oh, I, them. do not participate in Facebook groups any longer. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's rough. It's rough. But, but it all comes from people wanting to help, but it just stinks oh, yeah. that that the lay person does not have the ability to kind of fetter out which information is misinformation and and what is not. Well, yeah. And then there's also the reality that I think a, a lot of people don't, can't wrap their head around because so many of us still have that like Western medicine mindset where like, oh, I found this and it's holistic and it works for my dog. So guess what? This is what I'm going to tell every dog owner that they need to do. And it's like, no, Mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Every dog is an individual, just like every human is an individual. And while that's great, I'm so glad it worked for you. And maybe it is worth a try for a lot of dogs. It's, It's not like we should not just be like, every dog needs this. Yeah, you can never make a blanket statement. It does not. For sure. Totally agree. So, uh, okay. I want to We really talk wandered down the side road. We really did. I know. <laughs> I want to talk more about preparing to go on these like adventures. Um, yeah. but before we do that, like you 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 do DIY for your dogs, is that right? So, how do you, how do you manage, how do you manage that? Like, I want to know, I'm just not in a season of life. Like I, I've been telling, um, Kimberly Gautier for literally years. Like I yeah. want to be you one day. I want to be a DIY raw feeder one day. Um, but today is not that day. <laughs> today, today is not that day. No, I, I completely get it. And to be honest, the reason why is because I could not afford to do commercial raw. I, I couldn't, and even, I'm actually going to go check out a restaurant supply store today um, because I, it, the, the price of pork almost doubled uh, in the last two months. So I alternate between a base of pork or beef. Um, and I, I prep a month at a time and then I have like other proteins in there, but like my base meat will be pork or beef right now because that's, what's the most accessible to me and what's the most affordable and the price of pork per pound I was able, so I prepped yesterday for this month. So it's been two months since I did pork. It was two, like 30 or something like that, a pound for pork. Um, if you bought more than 50 pounds at the place where I go, you buy more, you get a deal. It was as low as two forty a pound. Yesterday, when I went up to the store, it was like three seventy. And when you're buying fifty pounds of pork, it's, it's a life. It was one hundred and eighty dollars, and like that's just for the base meat, you know. And then I have to get my bones, and then I have to get like oy- I use oysters and blue mussels for. I only need oysters when I do pork uh, because I need more zinc. I don't need them when I do the beef. And so it's like fifteen cans of oysters. 
between three dogs because each can only has about 5.5 ounces in it. Um, and each can is $3. So that's like $50 for that month for oysters. And then sim similarly, you know, the blue mussels are like $7 a pound. Uh, and so it's like, it, it comes out, it's getting expensive, man. Um, but really it's just about organization. I remember when I first started doing this, my husband looked me in the eye and he was like, are you crazy? <laughs> I was like, well, yes, that's not the point. Uh, you know, but I bought a stand up freezer and a chest freezer. Um, and we have our regular fridge and freezer and the stand up freezer is now packed full of all of their prepped meals. And the chest freezer is full of the meat and bones and other things. And it's just about knowing how much I have, knowing how much I need, and then kind of pre-preparing because I do have a co-op locally, thank goodness. Um, if anyone's in the Northern California area, it's the Fremont Barf Co-op, which sounds really appetizing. Um, and, and so luckily I'm able to get a lot of things through them that I would otherwise have been paying out the butt for. So. Um, you know, but they, we only order every other month. So I need to know two months in advance, what am I going to be prepping in the in-between month? Um, and so, you know, it's a lot of money up front, but then when you divide it between the months, it's a little bit less, but like I probably spend, and I was planning on sitting and breaking it down because I really actually want to know, but I probably spend between 300 and 350 a month on meal prep for the dogs. If I did commercial raw, that would be thousands of dollars a month. And I just cannot afford it. It's impossible. Yeah. I Sometimes I wish I had one. one small dog. That's what I only have one small dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I do commercial and it is expensive. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I look at it as, as an investment. Um, and I think, yeah, if I were in your shoes or Kimberly's shoes with the four big dogs, three, four, yeah, depending on, depending on what's going on in her house. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how, especially with my cat, I think I could do more without my cats because my cats are, um, well, we were talking er before we started recording. I have two that are 14, two that are 15 and yeah. they, I mean, I do the absolute best I can for them. Only one of them will eat frozen raw. The others will eat freeze-dried raw, which, by the way, is the most expensive food that you can yeah. buy is freeze-dried raw. And not that there's anything wrong with that. No, you're good. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. I get it. Like, a, the just the freeze-drying machine alone, the machinery is insanely expensive. So, and the processing yeah. of it. Yeah, it, it's not in, like... The side note. So my, my husband and I have a, um, a survival food company. So we currently only do canned meats, long-term storage canned meats. We used to do mm -hmm. freeze dried and th those machines are no joke. They are like more than a house to buy one of those machines. So wow. <laughs> it's not at all like, yeah, I'm just going to freeze dry. Like, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> so, no. um, it's not like when we look at it, a lot of pet parents look at it and it's like, you know, you get this tiny little bag of food and it's 40 bucks and they're like, I can't like, you have no idea what goes into that. There is so much yeah. that goes into that. That's why it is so expensive anyway. So they, my other three cats will eat freeze dried, which is stupid expensive, but it's the best food that I can get them to eat. So I buy yes. it. and then outside of that, they eat canned food. And I, I hate feeding them canned food, especially because m one of my cats is hyperthyroid. And I know, I know that comes from the can lining. Like, I just know that these, mm. you know, thyroid tumors are coming from the lining in these cans. I mean, of course it can come from other things, but like my cats have been eating canned food long enough that I'm like, I don't know, my intuition is just like, that's where it, it came from. But, um, you know, I try to feed them the highest quality canned food that they will eat. But again, we all know that cats will starve themselves. And so I break down a lot and I feed them crap that I don't want to feed them, but like they need to eat. <laughs> so I think yeah. my budget for my cats every, just for my cats every month is well over $500 just for my cats. So yeah, like I feel feeding that my dog on top of that. <laughs> 
It's cool that man. I use I alternate brands as well, and like I use small like small batch freeze dried is amazing. It's also amazingly expensive, yeah. but that's because it's so good. They're not they're using all right. whole ingredients. They don't have synthetics, you know. And it's like the way I justify what I feed my cats is that I alternate. So you know I'll use small batch, and I'll be like, mm-hmm. I'm feeling real good about this. No synthetics up in here, and then I'll give them something else, and I'm like. Well, there's a few synthetics, but they just got small batch, so it's fine. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like you do the yeah. best you can with cats. And I, man, I love my cats so much. And my goose, my cat goose, is getting a dental today, and he's 13. And uh, I won't do anything for that cat. I will lay down and be like, "All right, take me, <laughs> my cat." So, no, uh, I know. I, well, I hear it. I can't. I if I add it up. All of the money I have just I've spent just at the veterinarians' offices for my cats over my lifetime, or since I was eighteen, because that's when I started paying vet bills. Um, yeah, like I I could probably buy a house. It is insane what we do for our animals. I have one. So you were talking about uh, you know sepsis earlier. I had one cat who was at the end of his life was in the ICU for four days. Imagine that that yeah. bill, and he went septic, and that's what ultimately he 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 died from. So like that brought up all the memories for me. When he, it was ter- it was so terrible. Um, I yeah. have a cat that has had um, a p- perennial urethostomy, so a PU surgery, so he no longer yeah. has a penis. Um, and I have another cat who the hyperthyroid cat who has resorptive disease and he has had so many dental cleanings in his life. He finally this year had um, 17 teeth pulled this year. Like I cannot imagine, like I do not want to go back. I'm going to stress out for the phone call post x-ray, you know, and I do want to say before we go back to like traveling and stuff like that, I just want to say thank you to you because I've been listening to your podcast for a while, but, on my um, I I went on a big trip over the summer, and I kind of went and listened to some of your old old stuff. And I was listening to your episode about your cat who had to have surgery, and I think it was the same one that had the urethral issue, and how he was not being monitored by an anesthesiologist and had a cardiac arrest. And after listening to that episode, and then discovering that Goose <laughs> needed a dental, it gave me really good questions to ask. And I actually turned down to, or did not turn down, but did not book an appointment with two clinics that did not have a dedicated anesthesiologist um, for the procedure. So thank you, because had I not listened to that episode, I probably would not have thought to ask that. And I would have just assumed that like humans, animals get a dedicated anesthesiologist when they're under anesthesia and they don't. So make sure you ask. Making me cry. No, no, I I'm so thank sorry. you. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I no, thank you for telling me that because I I really appreciate the feedback and um it is important and I like our stories can impact people in ways that we often will never know. And he did it it I mean, we went um he didn't walk for a month. I, it was the crate like <laughs> and he's amazing today, don't get me wrong. He's he can't see. But yeah. I mean, he lost his eyesight, but I, I mean, to he's see. totally, yeah, who needs to see, yeah. right? <laughs> right? Who needs to see? Um, no, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad it was helpful because you're right. There are so many questions we do not know to ask mm-hmm. and they can make a huge difference in the, any, any outcome for us, for our pets, like, we we should definitely be more informed with all of the knowledge and information at our fingertips. We should be more informed than we are not. Yeah. Um, well, but it's not always accessible. But then it just takes, you know, one story, one podcast, one article, you know, one referral. And and then you become more educated and you never know if you're going to be that person for somebody. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> So back to, and I I promise I won't take up much more of your time, back to 
like prepping for all of these adventures that you're taking with your dogs? Like what you, you talked about the four things that you're like these like categories of things that you are thinking about that you're prepping for. What does prepping for an adventure look like for you and your dogs? Yeah. So it usually looks like me only getting three hours of sleep the night before is what that looks like. (laughs) Uh, because I could not, I have always been this person. I just can't do it like a week in advance. I am the night before panic packing. You'd yeah. think after 32 years of living on this earth, I would, I would be more organized, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. So, so, all right. So let's, I'll talk a little bit about my category. So like safety, my Jeep. Uh, so we, my husband and I, between the, the two of us have three Jeeps. One is a pavement princess, I call her, restored 1980, beautiful paint job, goes down to the ice cream shop, but does not go off-roading. And then we have our two kind of more rugged vehicles, Um, 2017 Jeep Wrangler, the the usual, you see them driving down the road, it's only a two-door. So two-door has the two front seats, and then obviously the two back seats, but only two doors. And I completely removed my back seat, and it now all belongs to the dogs, uh, the whole back. And so you're only getting in there if you are a driver, a passenger, or if you want to cram yourself in the back without a seat. Um, But from a safety standpoint, you know, one thing that I think a lot of people don't think about is car safety. And, you know, you see commercials for harnesses and, you know, safety leashes and for the little dogs, they'll put, you'll put them in like a bucket, you know, Um, I have none of that on my dogs. Instead, I have netting. And so I will often take, I don't have a hard top. I only have a soft top. So I'll take all of the panels and everything off of the Jeep and be, you know, quote, naked um, is what we call it when everything is off. And I have a netting that completely separates the front from the back so they cannot get up into the front seat. And then the top and all three sides are netted so they can't fall out. Um, And I don't have any harnesses for them because that netting will prevent them from going anywhere and they would get tangled so easily if they, there were three dogs back there with harnesses. Um, so that's why I kind of made that area their area. And then, you know, I try to have like cushioning for them essentially. So that's another thing that my husband likes to make fun of me for, you know, big barker. Mm-hmm. We have yeah. big barker beds. <clears throat> so we have two for the house and then I got one for the car. So they have this specifically marketed big barker bed for the car. And it's a little bit thinner, um, like like maybe this thick as opposed to like this thick for the house one. And, you know, it has shock absorbing technology. <laughs> I told him that. And he was like, <laughs> you should see his face. He's like, you're it's such um, an easy spell. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? He said, for the money, it better have shock absorbing technology. But so I have one of those. And it goes on the bottom, so it cushions them. And then it has these wings, which are really cool. And it goes along the sides so that there actually isn't anything metal that they lay on. Um, and that's important, not just if I were, God forbid, to get into an accident or roll down a mountain, um, but because it's bumpy. You know, I'm in four-wheel drive. My tires are aired down, so I have more traction. And I'm only going five miles an hour. But still, if you're climbing over rocks, I mean, you're getting shaken around. And it's like, so it's important to me that they're safe and they're comfortable. So that's a big thing. Um, and I forgot my big barker about this time. So that was great. Oh, poor babies. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's why you shouldn't panic. I could bless them. They had their normal beds. So they have like sleeping beds that I also bring so that everyone has something to lay on at night and not laying on the dirt or the floor of a cabin or tent or wherever we are. So I just use those. And it was more of a scenic trip than anything else. So they were fine. But yeah, shock absorbing technology. <laughs> so that's a big one. Um, you know, first aid is also important. <clears throat> and there's a few things that I want to add to my repertoire that I don't have yet. But I have, you know, Bear, he still has allergies. So his other issues before raw are gone. But he does still have environmental allergies. And they're much easier to control. And I actually only use CBD uh, for his allergies now. And so I have a tincture. And I have, is it okay? Well, I already did it, I guess. But is it okay for me to mention brands on this podcast? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I already said like, I already said like seven brands, I think. Um, but I use CBD dog health for him. So I have the Ease tincture. Um, I actually have the horse one and he gets that every day. And then 
one symptom that he always has is his paws get super dry and they'll get cracked. And Mm -hmm. that's like his biggest allergy symptom. And so I also will bring a salve with me. And I definitely need it at this time because um, the for the pine forest that we went to, the altitude was so high. It was so dry. Like my hands mm-hmm. looked and felt like leather. And so mm-hmm. by the time we got back to the campsite that night, like I was looking at the dog's paws and they were like, it almost looked like they were covered in chalk. They were so dry and like white. Yeah. So I actually put that salve on all all three of them. I almost said four because they have four paws. <laughs> three dogs, 12 paws. Um, so I put it on all of them because they were all dried out by this stretch. And then I put it on my own hands because they were real dry. So, um, but like stuff like that, I always bring colloidal silver. I always bring in case somebody gets a scratch or an injury. Um, nail clippers. I have dogs with dew claws. So I bring nail clippers because you never know if someone's going to get something caught on something like just the little things to try and be prepared for. You know, I have a brush and a de shedder because bear sheds like a psychopath. And so there is nothing worse than going for a hike and then getting back to the tent and realizing that your dog's belly is covered in, you know, brambles or briars and you have no way to get them out because you didn't bring a brush with you. So the little things really make all the difference because otherwise your hand picking those puppies out and it is not a fun time. Totally get that. So what do you do? You you obviously just bring plenty of water, right? And that's a, that's my biggest, like, it's so heavy. It's so heavy to have all this water, but you have to do it. So do you have, yeah, these huge jugs this, that you're showing. This giant jug is just for the dogs. <laughs> and then we usually have like the backpacks with reservoirs for ourselves. But yes, you have to bring a ton of water, especially because now they're feeding, now they're eating, you know, freeze dried or dehydrated. So they're going to need more water because they're not getting it in their diet right now. They're getting eight to 10% moisture compared to 78 to 80% moisture for four days. So they're going to drink a ton more water. Plus they're expending themselves. So they're going to be thirsty, you know, and it's always over prepared. Yeah. Yeah. I think that maybe one of the biggest takeaways for a pet parent to, 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 from this episode is like, if you're going from a, a actual raw diet to a freeze dried or air dried or dehydrated for a number of days, it, you, you need to prepare for the amount of water that they are going to need because it is going to way exceed what they drink in a normal day in your home when you're feeding them like the actual regular I, what is I don't know what the word I'm looking for they're they're normal raw diet <laughs> yeah like the mo- the moisture content the moist yes the like yeah. really really moist raw diet that yeah. has yeah. so yeah. much uh water content to it yeah that's yeah. that I think you could really find yourself in a bind if you uh don't prepare for all the extra water they're going to need and then you're just going to be giving them yours and you'll be thirsty. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think there's one last thing that I feel I should share. And I think it's common sense, but it's uh, another pitfall that I experienced this weekend. Um, and it's know your dog and know their off-leash recall. Um, and so of my three dogs, my golden retriever is the one that I watch the least because he's stuck to me like glue. And my other two are adventurers. And, you know, my my older Mutt Copper, he's um, part blue tick coonhound, and he goes where his nose takes him. And so I, <clears throat> wow. So I am always keeping an eye on him because he will, wa- like, you turn around and then you turn back and he's like a mile away with his, like, nose in a hole somewhere. And you're like, oh, come back, come back here. Um, and so if you are in an area that is not going to be safe for your dog to be off the leash, leave him on the damn leash. And I made a mistake this weekend and I'm very frustrated with myself about it. So when we are around people or a populated area or an area with roads or cars that are driving fast, my dogs are on a leash because they do not have good recall. But when we're hiking, they're fine. So we went to an old abandoned mine 
Um, and it was really cool. And there was a group of like 17 of us off-roading this weekend. So a lot of cars were all lined up. And since it was just us, like, I mean, there's a lot of us, but you know, it was just my, my group or so I thought we parked at the mine. I let them out and I let them be off leash. And by the time we trekked up, you know, like the couple hundred or so feet to where the mine area was, I realized that there were like at least 10 other people there that were not a part of my group. And, you know, there were two children and my dogs are great with kids. They love kids. That does not mean that as, um, you know, a mother of, they were probably four or five year old, you see two 65 pound dogs, you know, jogging your way with your two kids. You're going to be really, you know, you're like, uh, is this dog friendly? So I, I yeah. felt really bad. I was very apologetic. And Bear came back to me immediately. And Copper, of course, didn't listen. So I had to go and get him. And then the time that it took me to go and get him, I turned around and Bear was drinking some nasty stagnant water. Mm. And I'm so upset because, you know, I did not predict that there would be other people there. I didn't see other cars, but I didn't realize there were other areas that you could pull off and park. And so, and I didn't like scout the area well enough. So in the time that it took me to corral my more poorly listening dog, the dog who will put anything in his mouth, you know, took the opportunity while my back was turned and consumed something. And I was like, I don't even want to know what kind of radioactive stuff is probably growing in here. So now I'm in like full, you know, like watch with like binocular mode. Like, are you, are you itching more? Are you panting? How does your poop look? Are you drinking enough water? Like, I don't, are you being, are you less attached to me today? I don't know. Like I'm going to be watching him <laughs> literally like a hawk for the next couple of weeks to make sure that he doesn't start developing literally anything because you know yeah. so just know your dog <laughs> that's my last piece of advice yeah no it's all really really good information um because it's always that thing we don't think about beforehand that comes around and bites us in the butt <laughs> and yeah. and then we learn from it and then we do better next time <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully there were Tons of tidbits and takeaways um, for you pet parents who are interested in being more adventurous. <laughs> oh, oh, who's that? Speak of the, is that your the angel, bear? right? Yeah, that's my bear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all the, oh yes. Wonderful tidbits and takeaways for all of you who are wanting to be more adventurous with your dogs. And thank you, Kara, so much. Where can people find you and follow you, follow your adventures and maybe become more inspired to be more adventurous themselves? Yeah. So I have all of my stuff is named, I think pretty much the same. So uh, my Instagram and my TikTok are Raw Pod Ventures. And then I do also have a website, uh, rawpodventures.com, but that's for, uh, that's for like nutrition consults and like meal formula, recipe formulations and stuff like that. So I don't have any of my actual adventures on there. But, so if you want to go to that and talk to me about nutrition, that's awesome. Otherwise, if you're just looking to watch my dogs in cool places, then it would be uh, my Instagram and my TikTok, Raw Pod Ventures. Awesome. Well, definitely go follow Kara. Check out her website for nutrition consults because I think um, that is something, another thing that a lot of pet parents are not thinking about. And one of these days, it's going to bite them in the butt. <laughs> so check, check, check that out. Um, maybe get some custom meal formulations for your dog. And yeah. Thank you again, Kara, so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Wonderful conversation. I know we got a little off track, but I'm glad <laughs> you're down with it. <laughs> All good stuff. All good stuff. Thank you for having me. This was fun. It was just like chatting with the gals. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month 
for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh.